In 1979, a 58-year-old blind man was robbed and killed by muggers in this Brooklyn subway station. Herbert Murray, a 21-year-old with a criminal record, was arrested, tried, and convicted of the blind man's murder. When the judge asked me, did you have anything to say, I couldn't say because the tears were so much coming down for me, I couldn't communicate with him. I couldn't turn around and, you know, tell the family that they got the wrong man. During the trial, the prosecution presented no physical evidence connecting Murray to the murder. None of the prosecution's witnesses saw the actual shooting, and one was a known drug dealer. Nonetheless, the jury found Murray guilty of second-degree murder. Not only was I stunned, but the judge was stunned in this case uh, also. Fred Fetter, Murray's court-appointed lawyer, presented five alibi witnesses, including a housing police officer, who said Murray was hanging out with them the day of the shooting. After the uh, verdict was, uh, was in, uh, I was in the hallway behind the, uh, the, the courtroom when the judge said to me, uh, Fred, uh, had you tried this case non-jury, I would have acquitted him. The judge said he believed the defense's alibi witnesses and thought Murray lacked a motive to mug the blind man since he held a steady job supporting his young daughter. But since it was a jury trial, the judge was required by law to respect the jury's decision. So he gave Murray the shortest possible sentence for a second degree murder conviction, 15 years to life, meaning a parole board would have the power to set Murray free after he served 15 years and every two years thereafter. Here are excerpts read from a transcript of Murray's third parole hearing after he had been locked up for 19 years. 19 years is a long time. Yes, it is. But you're no closer to the rehabilitative process than you were the day you walked into prison. First step in that process is the internalization of guilt. You need to do some serious introspection, Mr. Murray, and come to grips with your behavior. I agree. You have to agree with that. I agree. But again, I just didn't do it. They didn't even want to listen to me. They didn't want to hear that I didn't do it. They want remorse. They want you to take responsibility. But how can you be remorseful? How can you take responsibility for something you didn't do? The executive law does state that the parole board is supposed to measure remorse or, or look and see whether the person is remorseful. They want to see that mea culpa. They want to see that come to Jesus moment where the prisoner gets up and says, I have done something wrong. The defendants must have a culpable mental state in order to be found guilty of a crime. Law school professor Daniel Medwed used to run the Second Look Clinic at Brooklyn Law School, which helped exonerate the wrongfully convicted in New York's prison system. He argues that when convicts who maintain their innocence go before a parole board, they are caught in a catch-22 he calls the innocent prisoner's dilemma. If that prisoner continues to maintain his innocence, he probably is not going to be released, or at least the likelihood that he's going to be released is going to be diminished considerably. Then the other option, of course, is if I do admit guilt. Even if I'm innocent, if I come up with the crocodile tears, if I feign remorse, uh, falsely accept responsibility, I'm going to greatly increase the likelihood that I'll be released. I can be a free man. I can be out on the streets. But you know what? In that process of doing that, I am sinking my ultimate chance to prove my innocence down the road because there is going to be something in the parole file an admission of guilt by me that prosecutors are invariably going to use against me in subsequent post-conviction litigation. Robert Dennison sat on the New York State Parole Board for seven years. Some people are innocent, but some people don't tell the truth either. So, I don't know. We have to, the parole board is not there to judge innocence or guilt because the person's already been convicted. So it's not even, can't even consider. We do, we do consider it as a human being, but you don't really, can't change anything. That leaves prisoners who profess their innocence with few options. Overturning wrongful convictions is the job of the appellate courts, not the parole board. But unless new evidence can be uncovered to justify a retrial, such as DNA test results, it is exceedingly difficult to get a criminal conviction overturned. As a prisoner, you don't have a right to post-conviction counsel. After you've been convicted, after your appeal has affirmed that conviction, you're on your own. No one knows how many inmates have faced Medwed's innocent prisoner's dilemma, but according to some legal scholars, 
The surge of exonerations based on DNA evidence in the last two decades reveals flaws in the criminal justice system that may have put thousands of people behind bars for crimes they didn't commit. There is this belief out there, and I think it's a myth, it's much more uh, fiction than fact, that everyone in prison claims to be innocent. If you maintain your innocence falsely before the parole board, you're not getting out. So in fact, a lot of prisoners take the opposite tack. They know that uh, feigning remorse, claiming to be empathic to the victim, uh, claiming to accept responsibility, whether they honestly feel or it or not, they know that that's the best angle to play, that's the best card to play in the parole process. So in fact, my sense is that the prisoners who do stick to their guns and claim to be innocent, there's a, a good reason to think that they're doing so out of integrity and not out of a desire to dupe anybody or deceive anybody. Herbert Murray's parole was denied a fourth time in 2000. In 2002, he was up for release yet again. And then when I went before the fifth part, I said, what the hell? Let me just tell these people what they want to hear. 23 years into his life sentence, Murray told the parole board that he had committed the robbery and participated in the murder of the blind man. I am taking the responsibility for it. I have been convicted, and I am taking the responsibility. Oh, Lord have mercy. I felt like I sold my soul to the devil. Because now, before, I had a little strength because I stood on the truth. You know what I mean? Now I don't have nothing to stand on no more. You know what I mean? But I became so desperate, I wanted out. I had to say something. I had to change something because what I was saying didn't work. Despite now confessing to the crime, Murray's parole was again denied. I said to myself, being that this is the first time I'm admitting to the crime and they hit me, maybe they want to see if, they, if I admit it the next time. Two years later, and after 25 years behind bars, Murray told the parole board he was guilty again, to no avail. The seventh time, I was in that room about 15 minutes. 14 minutes of those 15, I'm saying, I'm sorry I did this, I'm sorry I did that, I'm sorry. In that last minute, they asked me, did I have anything to say? And something just came over me. Say, her, don't leave this room without standing on the truth. So now, right in the minute of the interview, I flipped my story. And I told them that I didn't do it. You can't really blame an innocent prisoner for admitting guilt. You can't blame Herbert Murray for eventually being worn down by the process and saying, fine, I did it. I just want to get out of here. The parole board did not see it that way. It won't bode well for you if you're saying to us, I'm willing to lie to get out. Murray's parole was denied for the seventh time. A few years after I uh, retired, I was sitting downstairs in my office and I was thinking about uh, Murray. And I said to myself, my God, it's 2006. He was eligible for uh, parole in uh, 1994. I wonder what happened to him. Fetter discovered that his former client was still locked up. I was absolutely shocked to a point that it, was, it became the most important thing in my existence at that time to find out what, what happened to uh, him and why was he still in, uh, in jail and uh, to see what I could do to uh, get him out. Then we'll talk a little bit about coercion and fraud. Fetter enlisted the help of MedWed's Second Look Clinic which picked Murray's case out of thousands of requests for help. Clinic lawyers decided that parole was Murray's best hope for freedom. The question was, how could we convince the parole board that these folks were innocent and they shouldn't hold the prisoner's assertions of innocence against them in this parole release decision-making calculus? The clinic submitted a memorandum to the parole board on Murray's behalf, laying out his claim of innocence and including a letter from the judge in the original case stating he would have acquitted Mr. Murray if it was up to him. In 2008, after 29 years in prison, Murray sat before his eighth parole board. When the lady saw me, he said, a lot of people believe in your innocence. I started smiling. I said, yes. <laughs> Murray was finally set free in May 2008. He was given $40 and an expired bus ticket back to New York City. I have mixed emotion at this point. I felt good, but at the same time, I feel and do nothing. Thank you. You know what I mean? I appreciate I'm going home, 
But you hit me 14 years at this point. Murray now works for the 42nd Street Alliance, cleaning up Times Square. You still don't got it down pat, huh? No, I'm still digesting. I always remember that. He lives by himself in a Brooklyn apartment and regularly sees his grown daughter. His conviction was not overturned. He was just released on parole. This is a murder two charge. He's on parole for the rest of his life. If he so much as gets a traffic ticket, he might go back to prison. He might violate his, per his parole. So for Mr. Murray to try to exonerate himself, to no longer live under the cloud of parole, he's going to have to prove that he's innocent. And you know what? There are now records in his file saying that he admitted guilt at previous parole hearings. Take my 20s, my 30s, and my 40s. They think that their system is flawless. But I'm here to witness and say that they have a lot of flaws. 